just for a very comprehensive um, introduction there. I'll just share my screen and with any luck, uh, this works. Okay. Excuse, Zoom always puts a million and one windows on the screen. Hopefully none of them get in the way of the presentation. Okay, so I'm actually going to give a talk in two halves today. I'm going to give a, a general introduction to the energy sector in Indonesia, which is relatively short, but I think useful for you to, to have. That includes batteries, uh, electricity generation for the batteries, um, and transport which the batteries are used okay um and then the second half is a, a, a sustainable next generation battery uh system that may well answer some of the issues that are pointed out in in the first half of the talk um if we can make them work so uh i'd like to just firstly point out that uh indonesia has got um, the potential to generate 800,000 megawatts uh, of renewable energy, uh, such as wind, solar, tidal, and geothermal, which is a phenomenal amount of um, energy. That's 800 gigawatts of, of power from renewables, which is actually 14 times the country's uh, electricity consumption and you'll see at the bottom here that there is a, a solar map um, and this is solar power potential as a, a, a across Indonesia and that the majority of the the hot spots up here are actually in these southern islands here you've got a bit up here um, but the majority of them are on Java and then some of the more eastern remote islands out here okay so, so solar power may well feature uh, in the energy production of Indonesia, especially as there are many people uh, on the island of Java and there are many isolated people without electricity in these islands out here. Okay. Um, however, if you look at the electricity use in Indonesia, you'll see the following. It's pretty flat. Uh, as uh, overnight, okay? And this is because office blocks still have their air conditioning on. To a certain extent, Indonesia has a 24 hour culture. There is refrigeration, etc. industry. And then as the, the day rises, as, as the day goes through, it remains fairly flat actually, in the sense that when people go back to work, in, uh, in the day, there isn't that much of an increase in electricity. And I suspect the main cause of that is that uh, air conditioning is, is on all the time uh, in buildings, in, in uh, workplaces, and industry is 24 hours a day. However, when people do get home from work, there is a spike. And that's because they tend to switch their air conditioning off in homes in the day at the same time as perhaps workplaces might have uh, more electricity so they balance each other out and so you end up with a peak here in usage about eight o'clock when people get home from work related to uh, cooking uh, related to air conditioning okay this is a well-known peak throughout the world so when people get home from work they switch things on okay so you have this wonderful picture here um taken in um, this is Jakarta, of a building with all of the, air, the air, these air conditioning units on the on the side of it in some hop potch fashion, and that's that's the problem. That's the problem. So the load is a cartoon drawing of the load looks like this. Unfortunately, a cartoon drawing of the photovoltaic, um, uh should we say uh, load, the amount that you can generate from the sun looks like this. And so obviously in this area here, which is just colored in white, any electricity that's used, sorry, that's made by the uh, solar panels will um, be used. 
but any surplus in principle could be stored. Okay, so we need some sort of energy storage, and that's this is the fundamental idea. It's a, a power plant. In this case, the power plant could be wind or solar, which are not in this picture, followed by an energy battery storage facility. This might be a centralized facility or a facility on each household. Just have a power bank on your house. Um, and then power is bi-directional from the power plant and the power store to factories and houses. Okay. That's the fundamental principle here. Um, this energy storage facility is obviously key to expanding solar power. And there are lots of different options for energy storage. You have, starting with pumped hydro, um, it's actually a fairly high power rating with a long discharge time, which means that you can discharge it over the period that the energy is used in the, e in the evenings. Uh, it lasts a long time and it's pretty efficient. But the problem is it's not suitable in all geographies. It's not responsive to short-term needs of the grid. So if there's a grid outage somewhere, you can't suddenly turn on the water. It takes some time to build up momentum. Okay. Um, it's not suitable for microgrids. And actually, that you need to flood rural areas in order to do this. You need to have a dam, whether it's a dam up a mountain or just a dam at a higher elevation in a rainforest somewhere, you still have to have a, a large body of water that you're storing, which you then let um, out into another reservoir or water system. So it actually can be damaging to the environment. You have compressed air with similar properties to pumped hydro in the sense that um, it, it has a much higher power density, but it's less efficient. Um, when I talk about compressed air, I'm not talking about compressed air in cylinders, gas cylinders that you might have in your laboratory. I'm talking about compressed air into, back into the ground where we have removed natural gas that we have burnt. So you have a much, much larger uh, uh, volume that you can contain. So again, it's not suitable for all geographies. Fortunately for um, Indonesia, you do have some gas fields, but I, actually I don't know whether they're in a state where they could be used for this. You can literally melt salt and then keep it moving, keep it heated. And then uh, once you need it, you cool it to take the heat out. Um, it's expensive and it's not responsive to short-term needs. You can have lithium ion batteries, okay? This is a thousand to 10,000 hours. I should have put hours there. These are years, hours. 10,000 hours is about 30 years, so. Um, energy density, you can see the properties here, but they are really expensive unless you can use second use uh, uh, batteries. Lead acid batteries are toxic, okay? Flow batteries are an emerging technology. Hydrogen, where do you, uh, it, it's not all hydrogen is made from green sources, some is made from hydrocarbons, but it's also relatively mature. You could make it from solar, but it's relatively immature. A flywheel, literally a wheel going around and the faster it goes, the more energy is stored. This is fantastic, short-term storage. So if you have a grid outage, you have all that momentum, you can suddenly release, turn into energy. So, but it's quite low power. So there, there, are, there are examples. Now, obviously this is a, a battery focused talk. So I shall move on and talk about batteries. And I want to give you a little bit more context about batteries in the transport sector. So this is my old car. You don't own this car anymore. If I wanted to drive 800 kilometers, I need 45 kilograms of diesel and it would take five minutes to refuel. This is a, the most popular electric car in my country, the Nissan Leaf. To drive just 160 kilometers, I need 190 kilograms of battery, okay? And fast charging is 40 minutes, which is not very fast. 
So therefore, to drive 800 kilometers, I actually need 3.5 hours of charging time plus the time to drive the 800 kilometers. This is the fundamental problem. The range from, for weight, range for weight. That's the fundamental problem. Now, I've since bought a different car. Here's my new car. I have another Kia. This time it's a slightly smaller car. Um, it's an Exceed. To drive what 800 kilometers, you may notice it's the same. It's a hybrid, okay? So I only have 30 kilograms of cells, not 192 kilograms, 190 kilograms of cells, okay? Which means the whole energy storage system is 60 kilograms, and it only takes five minutes to refuel, and I can charge overnight. If you look here, much less fuel than to drive the same distance, just as a result of having a hybrid. So this, I think in the interim, until we can solve this problem, I think in the interim, this is a good idea. So to drive the same distance as a diesel, this diesel Karenz, I need, I, I actually did the calculation. It's 57% of the CO2 is emitted with a, a hybrid petrol system compared to an old school diesel system. Until we can improve the, the batteries, in particular, the range and the charge time, those are the two killers. I would like to know for anyone in the audience who is either Korean or Japanese, that Korean cars are not better than Japanese cars. I just chose these examples. So how do we make solar and grid work with cars? Because we've all talked about, well, we're going to have electric cars in Indonesia. We're going to have electric motorbikes in Indonesia. You have this problem that you make for, for take energy in the day and then it's used in the evening. Of course, this is down, this peak in the evening is down to people getting home from work, turning on electrical equipment. Well, when people get home from work, if they have an electric moped or an electric car, they're going to plug in the car. So there will be an additional load in the evenings. So we're going to have to take energy from the photovoltaic cell into a battery and then in, from the battery into, the, into another battery, which is a bit crazy. And it's not clear how the best way of doing that, if we're going to do it with photovoltaics, it may well be that you have hot swappable uh, uh, batteries that can be put into bikes and out of charging stations, which are charged in the day when you have solar panels. Another solution might be this thing called vehicle to grid. And this is rather than having separate grid power stations that, I'm sorry, grid storage stations that I discussed earlier, is that, is that you've got vehicles with really quite large batteries in them, which have, most of the time don't spend charged. If you think about it, you have a, say if you have a 300 mile range Tesla, top of the range Tesla car, how often do you drive 300 miles in a day? Probably not that often. Some people would, most people wouldn't. And actually, most people would maybe drive 50 miles, 100 miles. That would be the average. So you have 200, 250 miles of range in the car that's not used. So of course, you, you get home, you plug it in, and rather than the electricity going from the grid into the car to charge it, the electricity goes from the car to the grid to supply it with electricity whilst solar panels don't work. And then somehow overnight, you charge the car from base load. Okay. So the idea being is that it's cheaper because you don't have additional storage capacity needed. You have less CO2 emitted simply because you don't need to build less batteries. They're expensive to build in terms of CO2. And it's distributed. So there was, there was a small battery pack in every home rather than a big battery farm that could burn down or not be disconnected. So lots of people talk about using solar to charge cars, but actually there's a fundamental problem here. Okay. So the fundamental problem is that they're talking about using photovoltaics to charge cars and then charge to provide load, okay? 
but the, the cars are in load here, in use here. So you take energy from the sun into the home via an inverter. Okay, you then have an EV, bi-directional EV charger, so it can put energy back into the grid. So the energy from here goes into here, back into here. The cars are in use during the day, usually. That You have to charge the grid in the evening when there's the peak, which means you need to charge the cars between midnight or 11 p.m. and 6 or 7 a.m. The question is, where does that energy come from? There's no light. There's no light in the evening. The charge have got to be fully charged for the day because people used them. Where does the energy come from? Now, in the UK, the energy will probably come from nuclear energy. We will probably have expand our el a nuclear electricity program. We already are building two power stations. I think in Indonesia, given the seismic activity, that might be a mistake. Um, there's a lot of damage can be done to nuclear power stations as a result of earthquakes that we found out in Japan a few years ago. I think the obvious thing is geothermal. That will give you the base loader overnight. Um, there is uh, 30 gigawatt equivalents of geothermal power available in Indonesia, which I think will probably give you the base, base load, at least some of the base load needed to um, supply the electricity overnight to charge the cars. And the great thing is it's well distributed. If you look, the, the most populated island of Java has got a lot high, highest concentration of viable geothermal. Uh, uh, and if you look at the other, I think this is the second most populated, then you're in a, a position where um, you also have a large number of power plants. Uh, over on the other side of Indonesia, well, I suspect that the issues are different and that having uh, electric cars is not really going to be happening anytime soon. <laughs> so I think we're OK. And I think Kalimantan may well be that there are more um, viable sites uh, found as time goes on. OK, so I've given you a brief introduction of the energy sector as I see it in Indonesia and about what some of the ideas might be coming forward. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, a next generation battery electric uh, materials. So let's go back to lithium ion batteries because at the moment, the majority of the battery storage is lithium ion, whether that is for transport, for mobile phones or laptops, or even for um, sort of static storage on the grid. There's a massive uh, 300 million pound plant uh, near London, which gives uh, act as grid stability. Okay, so if uh, if you quickly go through the calculations currently with lithium ion batteries, the energy needed to actually make them is 500 megajoules per kilowatt hour of battery, which is a huge amount of energy if you think about it that results in around 200 kilograms of co2 per kilowatt hour released which is again that's quite a lot that's a 20 percent of a ton of co2 per kilowatt hour of storage and that's because lithium is extracted from a limited number of sources uh, uh sorry and there's also a problem that lithium is extracted from a limited number of uh, sources 49 percent uh, in 2015 came from just this region here. There's a little bit in America, there's a bit more in China, and there's a tiny bit in uh, Australia, and then there's the odd mine elsewhere. The majority of the lithium comes from here, which is actually a politically unstable area, and so problematic. And there's a there's an issue with uh, will there be enough, you know, is, is it stable enough supply? You need cobalt there's a shortage of natural material, there's a limited number of countries, also South America, and that's extracted from rock, which is environmentally damaging. So is lithium, by the way. You, you need nickel and manganese, and Indonesia has lots of nickel and manganese, but you still need it. And there's uh, that's a bit more common, but nonetheless, I think Indonesia has 9% of the world's nickel supply. 
copper is needed as a current electrode or collector. High demand energy demands to extract graphite. About half of it comes from uh, mines. That basically means uh, you, when you mine coal, you take the best coal and turn it uh, into car batteries. And then all of the other coal, well, what do you do with it? You sell it to be burnt in a coal power station. You're not going to throw it away having extracted um, the, the best graphitic coal. But so it actually, this is supporting uh, the coal industry, which is bad. And then the other half comes from synthetic uh, graphite, which is petroleum coke, which again, what happens when, what happens to the rest of the, uh, of the oil? Well, you sell it for fossil fuel burning, which is not good. Okay. So we need better, more environmentally friendly batteries. What about sodium batteries? Okay, so you've got, sodium is available everywhere. It's in the sea. Well, it's actually sodium carbonate is what you really need, but that's also available everywhere. You don't need to use cobalt electrodes. You don't need to use copper. You can use aluminium, which is much, much better for the environment. And rather than using fossil fuel based graphite, you can use uh, um, the carbon from natural resource. This is, you synthesize carbon from, um, uh, uh, in this case, this is uh, husks of uh, uh, palm trees, palm trees and uh, uh, coconuts. Better than that, actually, as a result of all of these processes being a lower energy, you, you suddenly, sodium mine batteries, have got the potential to provide energy of a quarter uh, of the um, of the cost of lithium ion batteries, actually. So the fu fundamental way that a iron battery works is that you have a separator, which is very thin, and then you have a cathode and an anode. And then when you are uh, discharged, you discharge from the anode to the cathode. And when you charge, you, ch you charge from the uh, cathode to the anode. Okay. This needs to have a uh, high iron mobility, but low electron mobility, because you want the electrons to travel by the external circuit and the iron to travel by the internal circuit. There are so many different cathode materials. Um, you, if you look at the working voltage compared to the capacity, there's longevity that matters here too, but I've not um, really gone into any detail here. The, the, the most in use in terms of sodium is the, the sodium chlorates. Um, material. Now in terms of, the, these are for sodium rather than lithium. So in terms of um, anode, again, there's a fair number of different anode materials here. Uh, and I don't see carbon anywhere, carbonaceous, there we go. Non-graphitic carbon, hard carbons. These are the ones that I've been working on because they have a low working potential, which is good for the anode. Okay. Um, so if again, this is voltage versus specific capacity, I've already sort of covered that. So the idea is that you take a biomass waste, you know, palm leaves is a good example. Anything that's got cellulose in it, okay? You put it into a pressure vessel with some water, some other additives such as um, citric acid. And then you um, cook it for, a few hours at 200 to 300 degrees C. If you harvest this early, then you can get small chemicals from it. So uh, you can then turn those into biofuels or polymers, use them for electric catalysis, etc. If you just, if you can also harvest, okay, carbon dots, which can then be used for fluorescent nanometers photocatalysis or phosphorescent tags and then if you do pyrolysis which is basically cooking in greater than a thousand degrees c you can then do nanostructured carbons electric catalysis heterogeneous catalysis gas absorption supercapacitors batteries okay so 
if, if you think about how a battery works, this is for an anode, okay? Where this is, these carbons, these ones in particular, the pyrolyzed carbons are for a battery anode. And that um, therefore needs to be a place where you can store charges, store ions, therefore it needs to be porous, okay? Now, the idea being is that you can control the porosity via different techniques. So in, you need to be able to measure the pore diameter. You need to be able to measure the pore distribution function. Okay. So the idea is that you can put in a, an X-ray beam, you get some small angle scattering that appears on detector. And then depending on what the Q dependence of this intensity of, of, of neutrons or X-rays, uh, you end up with a model that allows you to, you can fit it to a model that allows you to extract sizes and size distributions and things. So here is a typical spectra you've got in this region, um, you get peaks where they are corresponding to different atomic structures. Okay. And then in this region, you get some nanopores. Five nanometers is a typical size of a pore in our systems. And then you get macropores. So things that are microns inside out here. Um, you don't tend to get bumps out here. You tend to get a, a, an odd Q dependence. It's just this, if it was a typical physics, it would be one over Q to the four if it was typical scattering physics. But you, you tend to get odd Q dependence out here, so it's not one over Q to the four from which you can extract information about the macropores. And nanopores, you get peaks. Okay. So another thing that you can do is uh, Raman. Here is an example of an, um, uh, a hard carbon where you get some carbon balls, okay? And then uh, small angle X-ray scattering would tell you the size distribution of these carbon balls, okay? You can do Raman, and then the Raman will tell you uh, what's happening to your double C, uh, C double C bond modes, your stretching bond modes, and, with it, and, and the evolution of uh, graphene layers as you anneal this. As a function as a function of temperature okay uh, an open question is um what is the sodium storage mechanism in these materials there are two distinct um regions in the discharge curve you have a a plateau region and then you have a discharge uh, sloping region here Okay. Um, it's complicated, but the sloping region has been explained by the sodium insertion into nearly parallel graphene sheets. Okay. And then the plateau is described as intercalation uh, between extended graphene layers or nanopore filling. So nanopore filling, for example. Okay. And the thing is that you can get different assignments depending on whether or not uh, what you do to the sample because you, annealing is just one of the many things that you can do with these carbon systems. Uh, for, for example, you can soft template, you can add uh, various chemical precursors into the, um, uh, into the hydrothermal process, okay. So let's look at the structural characterization. We do our biomass waste, we put it into a, a, a self-generating pressure system. Um, and we then anneal it at a temperature. And then we end up with something that looks like this. We do sax and wax, um, either a synchrotron or a lab. And then you end up with an S of Q, which is essentially intensity of uh, Q-dependent intensity of X-rays as a function of Q, where Q is 2 pi over D. And you can see immediately that you've got some structure out here that give you uh that it with neutrons this blue line here shows you the q range of the neutrons the red uh area orange area here shows you the q range of the x-rays so you get some of the you get some of the information out here with the x-rays but you lose you lose it you need neutrons for out here so you can see here that there's some bumps in the small angle region corresponding to nanopores, 
And then you can see out here that there are some peaks associated with carbon-carbon uh, bond lengths. Uh, here is a figure um, which shows what happens when you kneel. And unfortunately, I've not labeled it. So, but I have labeled here. All right, let's go back. This is neutron scattering data. So this is data that's taken out here, but it's now in D rather than Q. So this is two pi over this. And you can see that when you anneal and when you don't anneal, very, very little happens down here, which is this region here. Something quite significant happens up here, which is this region here. Remember, they're inverted. If I now look at the temperature dependent of, as you move through the precursor, you can see this not heated through the heated, this bump appearing, which means that the pores are forming. You can also say, I said there wasn't much happening, but actually there is. There's not much happening here. There's not much happening here, apart from perhaps a slight sharpening, so a slight increase. But as you can see here, there's a, a peak appearing that isn't in down here. And this is carbon ring diameter. So we're beginning, we're, the annealing process appears to be creating some carbon rings, or at least an ordering some carbon rings. Okay. Now it's possible to, uh, to plot D2 over D1 uh, versus temperature. And you can actually see there is a small trend here. Although it's not observable in the raw data, if you plot D2 over D1, that's the peak height. So the position doesn't change, but the peak height does slightly. And you can see there is a trend here. And this is, there are more next nearest neighbor carbons, which is CC, uh, in the sample as you increase the temperature. And then at the same time, you can plot D3 over D1. This is the ring diameter over D1 to give you more aromatic rings as a function of temperature. So what's happening as you increase the temperature is that you are increasing the graphitic nature of the material. You're turning the material from a, an amorphous disordered carbon into a more ordered graphitic carbon. Increasing the next near, nearest uh, um, neighbor carbons, which is within the ring, increasing the ring, the number of rings. Um, now, if you look out at the other end out here, okay, if you look out here, you can see between not um, annealed to annealed at 1500 degrees C, you can see this peak has really strengthened. And this says that in addition to what's going on with this, the rings, you're also getting an increase in the intensity of the pores. And that means the pores are becoming uh, more ordered uh, and possibly more um, numerous. But then when you increase the temperature further, actually, the intent that the peak intensity doesn't change much between 1500 degrees C and 1700 degrees C, but it does become more sharp, significantly more sharp. And this suggests that you've got um, this. This suggests that you, you're actually having um, more order formed. So the pores are probably becoming more numerous. And then they become more ordered as you increase the annealing temperature. So the pore size increases as well. Okay. And the distance between the graphitic layers becomes more graphite like as you increase the um, temperature. Okay. And the, the other the O2O also becomes more graphitic. Um, now, if you look at the specific capacity, if you look at the capacity as a function of a potential, as a function of different annealing temperatures, you'll see that the best is probably 1300 
in terms of capacity. Uh, okay. So in other words, 1300 is about here. So if you get the port diameter too big, you don't end up with um, a good battery. If you get too graphitic, you don't end up with a good battery. So you need sufficient pores, um, but, you, but, but you, you mustn't have too much order. You need enough order, but not, in, not too much order. It's like a, an optimization process between the number of pores, the size of the pores, and the order of the pores, which you can do with temperature. Okay, so another thing that we did, and this is my last part, I don't know how long I've actually got, but this is my last part. Another thing that I, uh, that we did was some MUSR, and there's some more work coming out on this soon, we hope. And this is a technique that allows you, you implant a, a spin polarized beam of elementary particles into a sample. Then they process around the local magnetic fields in this case, it will be sodium uh, nuclear moment, okay? And then you measure the polarization of the muons as a function of time via detectors because they decay into positrons and those positrons are emitted primarily in the direction of the muon spin, okay? So this is like a big lighthouse that goes around or spin flips or does whatever it does, which you then measure using detectors, okay? I'm not going to go into the detailed physics of this, but if you take it to 50 Kelvin, then you get uh, and apply a magnetic field that's just transverse to the muon field uh, spin, you get a, a precession and then disorder. Sorry, the, the disordered spin system that you get at, as a direct result of sodium being static, so the sodium couples to the muon, this reduces the polarization of the muon. When the sodium is hopping, then it's not coupled to the muon anymore, and therefore it doesn't reduce the polarization of the muon as a function of time. So if you can measure this polarization as a function of time, uh, fit it to an appropriate model, uh, and then extract the hopping rate, one over tau, um, or as a function of temperature, in these systems, okay? So we had a sodiated activated sample of 1300 degrees C because this is the best. And then we had a, a desodiated uh, sample, okay? Activation energy of the sodiated sample is about 88 milli electric volts, about 152 milli electric volts in the desodiated sample, okay? So DFT tells us that the, DF, that the graphene sodium activation energy, graphene, not graphite. Um, that's really important. You can't do DFT in big systems, but you can on graphene. So it, the excitation energy is about 100 milli electron volts, which is pretty close to 88, which is measured. So it does suggest perhaps that one interpretation is that the muons or other sodium is migrating along a single graphene sheet. Okay. The desodiated calculations uh, demonstrate this barriers between the two graphene sheets, which is pathway two here. So when you have more than one graphene sheet there, uh, which suggests, which has an activation energy of 180 milli electron volts, which again, 852 milli electron volts com compared that to the um, experimental data is pretty, pretty good agreement given this DFT. So I think what's going on here is that when you've got large pores on the inside of the pore, essentially the sodium sees it as a, a graphene sheet because you've got a big five nanometer pore there. Okay, and then you've got sodium diffusing within the pore. And that's what this sodiated material is. But then when you've got desodiated material, you've, got, you've gotten rid of all of the easy stuff. You've just got the hard stuff. And then it's actually this corresponds to, to sodiums that are sitting between graphene layers. So the sodium goes in and it gets stuck. It can't come out. It's fully discharged, yet there's still a sodium signal there. Okay, so in a, a, and we know there is lost capacity. When you charge, discharge a sodium ion battery using an anode made out of hard carbons, you know that you lose capacity 
as um, on the second and subsequent discharges, but mainly when you go to the second. And this is a, as a result of the sodium getting stuck between graphene sheets. The muons can measure both. However, the sodium stuck between graphene sheets is still locally mobile. This is why the muons measure it. It's still locally mobile. It's just that it's stuck, it can't get out. It's not macroscopically mobile. It can get in and then it gets stuck, okay? So in other words, we've got high mobility sodium that is inside a pore and low mobility sodium that's stuck inside between two graphene layers, okay? Uh, so future things would be in situ SACS or PDF. Uh, Ava, my PhD student, who I don't know is if she's here or not, uh, she, uh, she's Indonesian and she has got data uh, on in situ. Uh, actually, it's not in situ um, uh, electric chemistry, it's in situ hydrothermal carbonization. We expect a paper to be coming out relatively, or to be written relatively soon. I would hope that that paper will be uh, in a good journal. Um, we've just been asked to write a paper, for example, to APL uh, uh, Materials, which is a good journal. So that might be something to aim for. Um, so we've done, in fact, these are the results. We've done some preliminary in situ measurements to, where we're looking at carbon sphere radius as a function of time in a reaction chamber. And then we're looking at polydispersity as a function of time in a reaction chamber. Um, and then finally, some new batteries for grid storage. I did say earlier that you have an electrode and an electrode cathode and an anode separated by a thin separator and then ions go from here to here or from here to here, okay? It, you can also have a different concept of battery where you have a much thicker separator um, and then you store different charged ions in anode and cathode so that you end up with it, the separator becomes a much much it becomes an active material so you have uh, uh, uh cations going from here to here and anions going from here to here uh, when you charge discharge and they don't go between anions or cations don't go between here or here so rather than just having the sodium metal as an active ion species you have the negative ion also as an active um ion species they have some advantages that, and disadvantages. They're slightly lower energy density compared to standard lithium ion batteries because they are um, because they are uh, thicker separator. Uh, they're safer because of the materials that they use. Uh, they can't do fast charging. So absolutely no good at all for cars. Uh, they are significantly cheaper. So absolutely um brilliant for large-scale storage uh in principle they have a cycle lifetime but in practice nobody's managed to do it yet and they're both quite low power just to put it into context this is the current situation of lithium-ion batteries and you can turn a lithium-ion battery uh, which is i don't know 80 euros per kilowatt hour storage into something that in a principle cost um 20 something okay so that's a quarter of the cost so this is the team uh, i'd like to thank everybody here so you've got people from surrey this is uh she's now in denmark as an assistant professor uh, uh this is uh, amelia uh, olsen she's absolutely brilliant did the dft work magda titterici she did the carbon work uh she's the materials chemist that did the carbon and then this is her group. Uh, she's got a large group there. <laughs> uh, postdoc, PhD student, PhD student, PhD student, PhD student, PhD student. They're the people that made their materials. Uh, Anos, who now works in Denmark, uh, he uh, was a postdoc working for me for ages, doing um, neutron scattering, X-ray scattering. Ava, who's done a bit of materials development and a bit of X-ray scattering. She's uh, used to be in Evie's group in Indonesia, and she soon will go back there in a year or year and a half. And then finally, uh, uh, Oliver Dix, who is was a postdoc working in my group for a while. He did some data analysis for me, 
uh, of the neutron scattering data. He's since moved to Canada, uh, but he's moving back to Queen Mary as a research fellow next year, which we're going to be delighted about. So um, thank you, everybody. I don't know whether I'm over or under time. Um, it's 50 minutes. I think I was told I had an hour. So we're probably okay. So I, I think I'm going to stop here and ask if there are any questions. <laughs>